Thanks very much for the kind introduction and thanks the audience for uh, coming here this evening. And um, uh, of course, it's very special to be to give a lecture in this in this uh, place. It's my second time actually, and I was instructed to stand here because it gives the best acoustic. So <laughs> I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, so this is a story of science, of active science, with hundreds of people around the world actually working on it day and night. Uh, and with results which were just announced in recent weeks, new results. And yet it goes back to, we'll see how far back in time, those questions about our universe as a whole, and within it, the question, what is it made of? And the result is very strange. It's almost, I would say, the level of science fiction. When you hear the, what universe we live in, it just doesn't make much sense. But that's what we're measuring. So what you see here is, uh, the, the, I put, put the name, of course, dark energy, but also um, uh, just to sort of wet, wet, wet your appetite, uh, these are results from one survey in which we've been involved called the Dark Energy Survey, DES. And uh, this is a map of the dark matter produced from that um, survey, and here is another survey in which we're involved, which confusingly is called DESI, uh, where dark energy is spectroscopic instrument, and each dot here is a galaxy. We'll see, we'll see more about it. But in between, of course, the great person, Albert Einstein, here experimenting gravity. We don't know whether he managed to stay on his bike <laughs> or not. We don't know, but um, we'll probably never know. And, uh, but uh, he was clearly, almost everything we do, is based on papers he's written, you know, just with a pencil and a paper. And uh, I'll, I'll show one of them in particular. The lots of, one can get quite philosophical about this topic, and towards the end I'll allow myself to have some reflections which normally I don't allow myself to express in ordinary conferences, because then you have to be very formal and talk about calculations and equations. And to, I think it's an opportunity to give this talk to think, what do we actually think about it? So before that, just... This is one of my favorite quotes. Steven Weinberg was a particle physicist, won the Nobel Prize, and he published in the early 70s a very nice popular book called The First Three Minutes. And in there, there's this very nice quote, uh, therefore to understand the universe is one of the very few things which lifts human life a little above the level of farce and gives it some of the grace of tragedy. Uh, so when I go through low moments in my academic work, I read this and think, wow, it's actually I got a nice job. Uh, so uh, the outline, I'll talk a bit about the background to this, the history. And there is this Greek letter, you will see it in Greek as well, but it's called lambda, which is a cosmological concept introduced by Einstein in 1917. And in addition to that, we think it's called dark matter. I will show you where these ideas came from, including a relatively unknown fact that even Newton thought about it. And then the question is, what is it, this lambda? And technically speaking, is it on the left-hand side of the equation or the right-hand side of the equation? And, and why is it so small, actually? Not why it's so big, but why is it so small? I will also, again, allow myself to ask, you know, when, when do you stop? When do you decide you you think you figure out the universe. Uh, and finally, one cannot talk these days about science without talking about AI. I was interested in that for many years. In fact, uh, when I was still back in Cambridge, 30 years ago, I did some work on AI. And then now it's a big topic, and, and we, we have an active uh, doctoral training program at UCL. But you know, again, I'll take a somewhat critical view. Do we see an evolution or a revolution? So it's quite a lot to go through, I believe, uh, within an hour. Just where are we in space? I know there are people here who uh, think a lot about astronomy, morning to evening, or morning to morning, maybe, and, and, and others who maybe just came to just learn about another topic. So uh, just to remind you, you know, we live around the sun, and when I was at school, 
we were told there are nine planets, and then one of them got degraded. To, so now there are only eight. However, good news, since then, uh, the community has discovered, since 95, discovered uh, over 5,000 planets around other stars. So we lost one, but we got several thousands. <laughs> and our colleagues at UCL are active in this field. They're even planning a satellite to do that. Uh, now, the motion, remember the motion of, of this, uh, uh, these planets as you go further away, the velocity by which they rotate gets smaller because, you know, those nearer to the sun move faster. I'll come to that. I'm saying it for a reason. Then, this is, an art, this is of course, an, uh, just a picture by an artist, and this is another one by an artist. And this is our own Milky Way. So we live inside the Milky Way, uh, which is about 100 billion stars, okay? Uh, and uh, about a billion were recently uh, actually uh, cataloged by, by uh, well, observed and cataloged by a satellite called Gaia. And the thing to remember, really, we are in a relatively unimportant place. You know, it doesn't look anything special. I mean, it's like taking a picture of London and someone lives in a neighborhood and it doesn't, you know... So we're really in a relatively un not an unusual place and luckily far away from the uh, center, and we wish to stay far away from the center because there's a black hole inside, well, well, well uh, documented. It's a black hole of four million solar masses, okay? So we better, maybe it's one reason we are not in an important place. Sometimes you don't want to be too important. Then this is a picture from an, a, a very successful satellite which is just started operating called the James Webb Space Telescope. And Again, this, the screen here does no justice. Maybe does we look at the small screen, may see it with better resolution. But you know, this is a cluster of galaxies. And here is a picture where each dot is a galaxy. So it's a lot about mapping stuff now, okay? We are going from a transition when I was a student with catalogs of thousands of galaxies and are, we are on the way with the next generation to catalog billions of of, of, uh, of galaxies, and remember, each galaxy has 10 billion stars. But I don't want to sound like Carl Sagan. Billions and billions and billions, but it's good to get some, some of these numbers. Now, I mentioned th this galaxy we're at actually rotates. Just like the planets rotate around the Earth, our, our galaxy rotates. It rotates at 220 kilometers per second, so you can calculate the distance we're going to pass by the end of this lecture. Uh, and the amazing thing is that what we see is only the tip of an iceberg. In fact, the whole galaxy is embedded in a halo of dark matter, which is tens of times more massive than what we see. So this is, now, you can ask me, how do you know? I, I, I'm just telling you that. Is this science fiction? No, it's not science fiction. And we should really be grateful to an astronomer called Vera Rubin, uh, uh, she, she passed away, sadly, in 2016. I had a chance to meet her a few times. A very remarkable, remarkable uh, astronomer. And what she did was to look at other galaxies, because then you can see them from a distance, and you can map the velocity against distance. Here it's in light years. Light year is the distance the light travels in one year. Uh, the, the key point is that you'd expect, if most of the mass is there, you expect the velocity to drop, just like the outer planets in the solar system move slower. And the big surprise, she looked at this, and instead, the velocity goes up. It, it levels off, kind of levels off, one way may say. Okay? And that's a big surprise. How do you explain it? So one easy way to explain it is to put us inside a, a dark halo. You can do a simple calculation and show that if we are inside a big, massive uh, structure, then you can explain it. There are some other ideas that say maybe we need to modify Newton's law. Uh, but this is the leading theory is that there is dark matter, but we don't know what it is. So we're in a strange situation that we need something there, but we still don't know what it is until 
our friends, the particle physicists, will actually discover it. So that's one mystery. Now, all that, of course, has to be placed in the bigger picture of the universe. So this is 13.8 billion years of the universe in one diagram, uh, which started in a Big Bang. There was a, a, a small uh, episode called inflation, nothing to do with the other inflation, uh, which happened when the universe was a tiny fraction of a second. Then the f elements formed, these three minutes that Weinberg wrote about, were all formed. Uh, but these are just the light elements were formed at that time. Okay, the hydrogen, helium, a bit of lithium, all the rest was formed, was cooked inside stars much later. There's the cosmic micro background when the universe suddenly finally became transparent. Then matter formed, galaxies and so on. And then dark energy sort of kicked in. Um, so this is kind of a sequence of what happened in, in 13.8 giga years. That's what we believe the age of the universe is. So what does it actually mean? And how do we know the universe is expanding? This is a very simple illustration that on large scales, galaxies are moving apart. And the velocity is proportional to distance. And always people ask, what is it expanding into? And it's not expanding into anything. It's, the whole thing is expanding. People give the example of, a, a, you know, when you bake a raisin cake, you know, the raisins get further away from each other. Of course, then people ask me, yes, but it's in the oven. No, no. But if you just think, think just, just about the cake itself, it's, the whole thing is expanding. Okay, and each raisin would see the other one going away from it. And the whole space is expanding. And that's what you sort of see. You know that after a while, the, um, the same box is just getting bigger. And the distance between the galaxies gets bigger as well. Uh, and then uh, now you can ask the question, OK, we observe the universe now after 13.8 13, 13 uh, giga years. So can we speculate what happened before? So you can run the movie backward, and then you conclude there was probably a big bang. OK, so that's the, that's the logic. Now, the universe is expanding as a result of it. And this comes from Einstein's theory. Light gets redshifted. So there, it's somewhat similar to Doppler effect which you may know in the old days when the trains pass, you'll hear a change in the frequency. And that's what happens. The further a galaxy is, the faster it's receding, and you get more redshift. It's getting redshifted by more. And now, you know, people with, with the JWST found galaxies which are you know, redshift, very high redshift of 14 when the universe was really very, very young. So then Hubble and independent Lemaitre plotted the recession velocity against distance, OK? So you just made that plot. Now, the original plot is very noisy. It's not as nice as this one. But the, the, it's basically the velocity goes like h naught r. h naught is called the Hubble constant. And there's a huge debate about its value. Again, when I was a student, there were two astronomers who had very dramatic debates, whether it's 50 or 100. Now I have colleagues who argue whether it's 67 or 73. But they still, they're very emotional about it. <laughs> and, and you can't, you know, you talk to them and that's what they believe. Each of them believes in that value. We also discovered that the universe is actually flat. Now, what does it mean? It doesn't it mean that the Earth is flat. I, I don't, well, I'm not a member of the flat, flat Earth Society. Don't worry. <laughs> But I am a member of the Flat Universe Society because we have a good indication that it's not, not the top one, spherical, not the bottom one, but it's the middle one. The easiest way to think about it, if I have two laser beams and I just point them, in a Flat Universe they'll remain, and imagine they're so strong they can go for billions of light years, they will remain parallel. Okay, while in the other universes, they will either diverge or converge. So that's the way to think about it. So this is a big discovery. Now, how do we know that? I'll speed up a bit. How do we know this? Because 
there is this amazing discovery, the cosmic micro, micro background, discovered in uh, 1965 uh, by chance. That's another story, and that's what it looks like. Now, what is this color map? Uh, this color map shows the temperature of that radiation. This radiation originates from the Big Bang. In fact, that's why we say hot Big Bang. And even now, there is a relic of this radiation. At present, the temperature is about 2.7 degrees Kelvin. Those of you who remember the old TV, when you switch channels, there's this kind of snow. 1% of that snow is actually the cosmic micro background detected by, by the antenna. Okay, in our, in, on our roof. Okay, so you all you have all seen it. One percent of it. It was temperature was much higher before. Now it's lower, but we still see it. And the red means it's a bit higher above the average, by one millionth of a degree. And the blue it's below. And this looks kind of maybe not so uh, dramatic. This picture, uh, but. In fact, if you do a mathematical operation, which is called Fourier transform, or more specifically spherical harmonics, which chemists use a lot, um, you can plot it in a different way, the same information, and then you discover that it's not at all random distribution. There's a feature here. And this has to do with the competition between dark matter and ordinary matter. They oscillate. It's a bit like a pendulum, in a way. And it has a particular feature at one degree on the sky. And that's very kind, because that means we have a, a ruler. We have a ruler, and we can measure distances. Okay? And we can do some geometrical tests, which is the main topic of this lecture. And um, the um, key thing about Einstein's relativity, first he had special relativity in 1905, but then in 1915, Ten years later, he came up with general relativity. And the big idea there is that is this concept of space-time. There are four coordinates, and they're not, they can actually be, you know, they can bend. They're not, it's not static, okay? There's a lovely quote from by another physicist called John Wheeler, who said, matter tells space-time how to curve, and space-time tells matter how to move. Now, by this time, I'm sure you've lost me completely. So let's try to do a very simple experiment to see if we can actually uh, have some intuition for that, okay? Very simple stuff you have at home. So this is just a blanket and, um, and just a tennis ball and another ping pong ball. And I'll ask volunteers, we had to practice a little bit in advance, so two volunteers, Shira, who happens to be my daughter, and, <laughs> and, and Nina, her friend, um, and all, all, all it is is just, here is our space-time, okay? This is space-time, just with a blanket. And um, we, yeah. I decided, by the way, you know, I, I, I'm very keen watching, watching the Christmas lectures, and our colleagues from chemistry usually have big explosions, but I was not so brave <laughs> to, to blow up the whole place and to bring a black hole here. So it's very, much simpler, okay, much simpler. So if, if, you, if you keep it very, very... Uh, flat, as flat as possible, and I will just, here is, for example, the sun, okay? What you can see is that it causes bending of space-time, right? Now, if I put a much heavier object, it will get, the bending would get much stronger, and if I put very, very massive object, it, it will be like a black hole. It will, you know, go all the way to the floor, okay? And then, so this is what Wheeler told us. Matter tells space-time how to curve, right? But Wheeler also told us space-time tells matter how to move. So now here is the Earth, let's say, and, you know, you see, it has a, in this case, it managed to hit the sun, which is not the case. <laughs> if, I, if I do it, if you practice it at home, you can get it to the point it would actually form an ellipse. Okay, so it depends what angle and energy you give it. But, but that's the idea, basically, which if you remember those two sentences there, I think you more or less get the essence of general relativity without any equations. But still, you know, we all have to agree it's, it's a pretty abstract co concept that it's not a mass, it's actually the amount of curvature. 
and motion is caused by this curvature. So I think that's this demonstration. Thank you very much to Shira and Nina for, for okay, very good. Thank you, we can leave it there. Okay, so that's where we are now. We have to connect it now to, to our story about dark matter, dark energy. So I already told you the universe started 13.8 giga years ago. Now, the, the, the may, giga years means a billion. Now, the amazing thing is now astronomers agree with each other. They don't agree on the Hubble concept, but they agree if a conference you go to, that's what you'll see this diagram in the middle, that at present, I emphasize at present, uh, only 5% is ordinary matter, okay? The stuff we see here, this glass of water, this theater, this laptop, myself, we're only belonging to 5%. And there's 25% approximately cold dark matter, which we've not seen it, like the one that generates the halos, and 70% dark energy. This was a paradigm shift in the late 90s. So when I was educated, we were told there's only 5% ordinary, but 95% cold dark matter. And if you mention anything about dark energy, people just laugh at you. Okay, they would say, okay, it's science fiction, okay. However, this goes back to Einstein, uh, this concept of dark energy, he didn't call it dark energy, he called it cosmological constant. And this is his paper from 1917, it's in German, but uh, you can find on the Princeton archive that translated all these articles. And it's really fascinating reading that. So this was, remember, only two, two years after the general, the uh, general relativity, and remember this is a period of First World War and all that, I mean, no, it's not, not easy times. But he had time to think about this. And now I'm doing something very, very brave here. And I'm actually putting Einstein's equation, so apologies. But I feel some of you probably use it every day. Some of you probably see it for the first time. But, you know, one cannot go through life on Earth without seeing Einstein's equations once, <laughs> at least. And mind you, this equation is, you know, being used, for example, your GPS has some corrections which are based on this equation, okay? So it's not completely, it's not, uh, you know, just, just a, a game of, of physicists. W what's interesting in that is, is that um, um, he put this, don't forget, don't worry too much about this. This means curvature. It's curvature like this blanket. And this lambda is what he put there on the left-hand side and here it tells you what generates the curvature. In fact, what you've seen with the blanket is exactly what this equation tells you. If you put some mass or energy, it will cause curvature. And this curvature will cause motion. And he put it on the left-hand side. Now, you can do some manipulations and come to that equation, which is acceleration equals minus gm of r squared. You've all seen it. This is Newton's law. Okay? That's why, you know, this... Uh, you know, this uh, apple, let's say, is falling on Newton's head because of minus of R square. However, there'll be an extra term, which is lambda over 3R, which is a bit mysterious. Now, what is very little known, even among professionals, that actually Newton also proposed that term. He didn't call it lambda over 3, but he, he has a this linear term. And... Um, some people read the whole of Principia and said it's the only place in Principia where he expressed emotions when he discovered two laws of gravity. So why I don't have time to explain, we've written a little article, you can find it on my website, which tells a story. But then he, then he went on, and I'll come to it, and when he wrote this equation, he wanted to apply it for the whole universe. And he wanted the universe to be static, neither expanding nor contracting. Why? See, that's when the human judgment comes into place. <clears throat> maybe some beliefs, maybe intuition. So he wrote this paper in 1917 that said that this, he can find lambda, he can add a constant, okay? It's a bit like a constant of integration when you do integrals, those, uh, those who play with mathematics. And he said, I'll tune it to such a way that it's a constant, that the universe neither expands nor contracts. 
which you can do formally. He did that, and then what, what happened, Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe. So Einstein said, oh, I should not have introduced this. And he said, this was the blunder of his life, okay, which is made it to the title of this talk. But ironically, we find lambda is there, but with a different value. So his mistake, the mistake of the great person, was to think that it has to be a particular value. Had he just said it could be any value, it would have been a, a, a prediction, right? So it's an interesting kind of logical mistake in a way he's made, and I feel very humble saying anything, criticizing Einstein. But in a way, he made a logical mistake thinking it has to be a particular value. And then we all followed that, and we thought it has to be zero. And 25 years ago, we realized, no, it's not zero, but it's not the value that gives static universe. If you understood that, my hand-waving on that, that's the bottom line of this talk. Okay, that he put something in, withdrew, but actually it is there, but different value. Okay, that's a narrative. His good friend Eddington, here they're sitting on a bench at the, at the observatory in Cambridge. I know that door very well. I used to walk through it every day. I worked there for 20 years. I know the door, but uh, uh, you know, and the, the spirit is there. You can still see the Eddington's dining hall uh, on that side of the door. And uh, Eddington actually liked Lambda, and he said he is a detective in a search of a criminal. He called Lambda a criminal. So that's it. A bit more in depth. This is the paper from 1917. This is the English translation. There are articles that summarize it. And uh, he chose, uh, for those of you who know Greek, he chose the, the, that version of the, the, the little lambda, not the big lambda. And he, by the way, he also talks about other reasons to have it, not just static universe. So this is a quick, some reflections on that. You know, although he said blunder of his life, this is the first paper that talks about relativistic cosmology. Um, also, it's the first paper uh, to propose lambda, and now it's a topic of projects of billions of dollars, okay, which we'll talk about. Billions of dollars, which keep hundreds of scientists busy. So just one paper, you know, one idea, uh, and you know, over, over 100 years later is, is such a topic. Uh, there is this question, about left-hand side, right-hand side, what it means is really whether it's part of the curvature or it's some energy. So those who think it's energy call it dark energy. And they even generalize it to something else, which I'll explain in a moment. And yeah, as I said, he failed to notice that the static solution is, is unstable and it was not what this universe is doing and that it could be just a free parameter. So that's the basic story. This is a little diagram to illustrate, now when, when physicists don't understand something, they make the problem more complicated. <laughs> okay, that's, that's it, an approach. So they don't know what is lambda. So they said, okay, let's make it more complicated. So they invented this W, which is equation of state, it's pressure divided by density. And it's a textbook exercise we give our students to show that the density will go like the expansion of the universe minus three, one plus W. Don't worry too much about the mathematics. The key point is that, um, the, the key point is that uh, when we have only matter, this is early times, that's the present, then the density gets, no, the universe expands, so the density drops with time, right? That's easy to understand. And it, it comes to 0.3 because that's a 5% plus 25%. But if what value, that's I think everyone in the audience can do this calculation, which value here would give me constant density? Well, the answer is W exactly minus one. If it's exactly minus one, you agree it's a constant. That's what you get. Now, a lot is going on, lots of debates, whether it's exactly minus one or a de deviation from it. This is a result from one of the surveys I've been involved with. You can see it's minus one to 3%, there have been two other results uh, in January, one in April, also give 3%, minus 1, 3%. Now it's your judgment. You can decide, look, it is minus one, I've done my job, I'm going to work for Wall Street now. I've done it, I've done it. 
other colleagues say, no, 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 3%, no, no. Let's put another billion dollar. Could we get to 1%? Okay, so it's a judgment. When do you stop? This has led, uh, as I'll, I'll show in a few minutes in more, uh, in more detail, uh, this has led to um, a big activity because everyone wants to understand what happened, Big Bang, how structure formed. And you can see so many projects. Some of them are on the ground. Some of them are in space. Altogether, we're talking about billions of dollars, OK? Thanks to the taxpayer for all that. Uh, and I will zoom in on just a few, kind of, like, sort of clo close to my heart. Uh, one, they're, they're both actually using old telescopes, which were built in the 70s. But they're really strong. They were built very well. Uh, 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 one is in Chile, and one is in Arizona. Each of them has a mirror of four meters in size, which is not now the much bigger ones. But it's quite sizable. And um, the, the trick was to, to, to have a new, you know, new, new instrumentation. Because they're really strong, they can hold massive stuff. So that's what happened. And um, these are international collaborations. The first one is led by Fermilab in the US and that one by Lawrence Berkeley in America. And we were very fortunate uh, soon after I moved to UCL to actually be involved in both. Uh, first this one, then that one. And this is actually, uh, the idea is to build a camera. Now the camera is, is just same principles as, as on your sm smartphone. There's a lens and there's a CCD except that here there are five lenses in DES, six in DESI, they're about one meter across, okay? And you have to polish them to the width of that paper, about 60 micron, in order to achieve that goal. We're very fortunate to participate in that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, our former dean, Sir Richard, Sir Richard Cutlow, at the time actually helped approving that. And uh, it's a reality. They were built by two colleagues of mine at, at UCL, Peter and David, just you know, in a basement just a few miles away from here. And now one camera is in Chile and one in Arizona. And they're doing wonderful jobs. OK? Now, but now other things are being built. And we get the uh, Rubin named after Vera Rubin, the woman who discovered the rotation curves. It's now named after her, and that's on, an, on a hill uh, next to that hill in Chile. And this Euclid, which is now already in space, already produced wonderful pictures, right? And we at UCL, as many other institutions, are involved in all that. Just to give you an idea, you know, these are only some of the projects. You can see the amount of data. It's also big data, which, you know, gives terabytes of data per night. Each night is like one terabyte here. And with other projects, will be petabyte. This is a radio telescope. And you see the number of galaxies. I mentioned you a few thousands when I was a student. And now this is already done. This is almost done. And these are the billions. You can also see the price tag. <laughs> so the way I convinced the, the, we convinced the dean and the research councils, we say it's only $1 per galaxy. <laughs> right? So it's an absolute bargain. And, and, and also, this is very interesting. Uh, it's it's the, the sociology, OK? You, you have to work with a very large team, come from different backgrounds, different seniority levels, from students to professors. That by itself is, is a whole subject. And it's one reason we've written that book. A lot of it is about sociology, OK? And how people communicate with each other. So it's not usually discussed openly, but I think it's very important. Now, to go quickly, I'm conscious of the time, how do you actually measure dark energy? You put billions of dollars, you map billions of galaxies. How do you do it? So the way you do it is nature is kind enough. You know, it doesn't tell us on the sky lambda equals that. You have to do it indirectly. And what we do is geometry. So these are called standard candles, standard rulers. What you do, imagine you have some stars which all look the same. It's like a candle factory produce exactly the same candles. If you put them at different distances, you will, you will see them get dimmer and dimmer. Now, because of space, the curvature of space-time, 
the amount of light you would see would depend what the universe is made of. It's all in this experiment with a blanket, okay? There's some energy, for example, dark energy, dark matter, would cause bending of space-time. Therefore, you'll, the amount of dimming would be different, okay? That's the key idea. You can do the same with rulers. And here, I, let me ask for two volunteers, if there are two volunteers who would like to come. It's a very simple experiment, don't worry, no explosions. Well, you can come. And maybe we need another person just to... It's very simple. You know, let me reassure you, those rulers are the same size, exactly, different color. And, and maybe if one of... If you hold it... Oh, sorry. <laughs> you are here. And maybe, you know, I can hold it, that one. I, I'll volunteer. You, you, if you just put, you know, hold it like this, and, you know, they're the same size, but I'm sure those sitting up there would agree that this looks smaller, right? It's so very simple. It is geometry. So believe it or not, these billion of dollars projects that do 20 years of work do exactly that. They see one ruler at that distance, another ruler at another distance, therefore they know the, re the relative distances, and in a universe with particular amount of dark energy, this ratio would look one thing, and another one it would look something different. And that's what it is. If you understood standard rulers, then you also understand standard candles. So I could have brought two, you know, two candles here, but it's safer to bring rulers. And, and, and you got, hopefully you got the idea. It's all about the way light propagates in curved space-time. Okay, so thanks very much for this. All right. Okay, so, so these are the two methods, methods I wish to, to expand on. This is, by the way, Mr. Euclid, who did, taught us geometry. And here is one ruler, yeah, and that's the other ruler uh, on the cosmic micro background because I showed you those bumps. There's another beautiful technique, but that's a whole other lecture about using the way light gets distorted along the way. So a galaxy which looks elliptical uh, would look actually, uh, uh, might have a banana shape or something. And it all has to do with, with the bending of the light as it goes through matter. This is a whole other lecture. So I decided, let me just focus on standard candles, standard rules, because there were results announced in recent months related. These are these two surveys I mentioned, um, 300 million galaxies for DES, which is photometric. You get images, and uh, now it's uh, you know tens of millions of spectra for DESI. And this is the DES survey on this beautiful hill in Chile. And this was uh, when we sort of opened it. And this camera, so this is the camera which operates just like your camera on your iPhone, uh, except it weighs several tons. <laughs> and, and, and just the camera itself, uh, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, just the camera itself, uh, the cost is $40 million. And it, it has taken 10 years to build it. And with different pieces moving around the world, including at the basement at UCL. So, you know, we all thought it was a good story. So we created that book. And I'm very grateful to uh, Laurent Shimanad, who is here, who is the publisher who convinced me. I won't tell you when. It's embarrassing. At some point, he convinced me to do the book. It's multi-author. OK, 27 chapters, 88 co-authors. And the idea was, I was frustrated with the previous project we did with the Australians, so they have a beautiful project uh, when I was back in Cambridge, but there was no story, you know? It's done, and what's the story? Why was it done? How did you get the money? How did people feel about it? So we thought we'll document it while we're on the flight. The project is not finished yet, but we sort of um, created that book, which is, you know, also outside, and I would like to just emphasize that, um, well, it was bad. Well, it was, COVID has done two things. Without COVID, I would not finish the book. <laughs> but at the same time, we couldn't have a proper launch event. Like, you know, so it's very nice that this evening we can actually meet and uh, discuss it and so on. And I would also emphasize really that the four parts to it is how it was built. Uh, and by an international team with all the complexities, the actual science, but also we talk about non, 
non-dark energy science, but there's also a chapter about reflections, which is about the connection to society. So there is a poem there, a chapter by a philosopher, a chapter by an anthropologist. Okay, and also some artwork. So, you know, it's kind of trying to put it in the general context. Now, there are many, many stories. One of them, when I went to the telescope, it all was wonderful, but suddenly an earthquake. And it was 8.3, the strongest that year in the world. Why did I end up there on that mountain that night? I have no idea. But these things happen. Here you can see the survivor's photo. Um, and what I can tell you is that all the stuff in the kitchen was completely smashed. All the glasses, everything was just, you came to the kitchen, it was just, but the telescope survived. The camera partially built at UCL survived. And uh, actually the observations continued the following night. So I find it quite, quite remarkable. So you can read that story. Now, one of the, one of the studies with that was to actually use standard, standard candles, which are these uh, um, supernovae. So no, nature did not put candles, but it put supernovae, means new, you know, super and nova means new, uh, in Latin, and they're, they're called 1A for some reasons. You can see that the supernova, when it explodes, it can overshine a whole galaxy. It's, it's a massive amount of energy. We think, or some colleagues think, that it has to do with two stars, and maybe just focus on, on, on this diagram here, that uh, this is a white dwarf, and there's, it accretes mass from this red giant, and when it reaches a certain limit, certain amount of mass, which is 1.4 solar mass, which is called Chandrasekhar limit, after the physics Chandrasekhar, then it explodes. And as a result of that explosion, what you see is the light goes up and then down. So, and you can do it for each supernova, right, when you find an explosion. The amazing thing is that this, the, the amount of light at the peak seems to be almost universal. I say almost. You need to do some corrections, which are a bit magical, but you correct and then become standard candles. And um, if you don't believe in it, talk to the Nobel Prize Committee in Stockholm because they gave Nobel Prize to the, two, to the leaders of the two teams that showed us this effect. And the point is, you can then use the... Uh, average distance between the galaxies against the time. So these are the data at the time. They got the Nobel Prize for only 42 objects, okay? And then you can draw different lines and you can then see that actually it's not the green curve which we thought was the universe we live in, but it's the one which is accelerating probably to dark energy, okay? So this is a Nobel Prize uh, result. And of course this generates lots of work, so with this with our dark energy survey, this massive camera, you look through different filters, right? You know, you know what I mean by that? You put different colors. And, and, and this is what you see here are 1,500. Compared with the 42, you see 1,500 uh, supernovae. This was announced in, uh, in January. There was a bit of press release. And some of our colleagues at UCL have directly worked on this. Um, and the, the key point is with this 1,500, indeed, Indeed, uh, you can see it's, it's, these are the data. The yellow, this is again distance, again redshift. I told you what redshift is before. And this is the old model, which is completely ruled out. And this is the model, which again has, I said 30%, well, give or take, that they found 35%, 65%. So, no, we're quite pleased with it. This is a project that started 20 years ago. You know, some of us were there from the beginning, and now they're young people analyzing and getting this result. This is more work on the dark energy survey, this time using this technique of dark matter, a project led by my former student. Uh, and um, again, I'm not discussing this technique, but it, it generates a nice map of dark matter. And uh, 
the BBC liked it, so we got some report, but there's nothing even more impressive is when you get coverage in private eye. <laughs> so the same day we announced the result, this was private eye version. So, you know, after 20 years of work, they said, it's our most comprehensive dark matter map yet. <laughs> Thank you very much, private eye. But anyway, any publicity is good publicity. I would also like to mention that the nice thing, you open a camera, you see many things on the sky. So we can do more than just dark energy. Uh, colleagues of mine even de detected objects in the solar system. Although it was done for the high range of universe, they detected that. So, you know, we, we always look for low hanging fruit to, to, enjoy, to enjoy all this data. And this is an example, I don't know if you could see, but um, over there, this is a galaxy, okay? And do you see this point is getting brighter and then fading? Can you see that? It, the movie repeats itself. Well, this is quite remarkable. This is a detection of gravitational waves from a binary neutron star, okay? So this is again another prediction by Einstein that when two objects collide, the space-time, the fabric of space-time wobbles and eventually will detect it. So this was predicted by Einstein 100 years ago, over 100 years ago. People worked with it for 40 years and, and they managed to actually detect it, okay? The amazing thing with this is that uh, it also, there's also a flash of light and the dark energy camera, partially built at UCL, detected that, that light. So it's a flash, it's a kind of light that is associated with collision of two neutron stars. And this can be used, by the way, to find the Hubble constant, which some of our students, students of mine worked on. And I told you the dispute, 67 or 73, we found 70. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we're doing something right. Now, then let's move to the baryonic acoustic oscillations. Let me explain what they are. So, uh, Arnold, if you can play the, the first movie, the short one. Yeah. So this is a little explanation what these baryonic oscillations are. It's only 40 seconds. Um, but, okay, I'll be quiet. Just follow the, what they say. Okay, so through some process, so uh, just to, to recap, there's this process that generates these bubbles, and again, when they all overlap, as they said, so you cannot see them this separately, but you can do statistical analysis which reveals them. To do that, you have to collect many, many galaxies, so that's DESI, where again, the part of the camera was built at UCL, and we will just start about 10 years after DES, so this is now coming to the peak, and those uh, results announced in April. So maybe if you show, we'll take this set of 14, only 14, only 14 million galaxies, and fly through them, okay? So these are actual galaxies which were mapped, this time on a mountain in Arizona, no earthquake so far. So let's see if this is, can really come through. Uh, Okay, it's a bit slow at the beginning, so just bear with me. So it's called DESI compared with DES. Um, right, so there are 14.7 million galaxies. I haven't counted them, but let's believe that's true. And uh, let's see, we'll fly through it with a rather dramatic music. So try to imagine there are these bubbles that are going to teach us about distances in the universe, but there are so many of them that together they give this rather 
amorphous structure. And then we have to un do some statistical tricks to find a very s small signal of that. Yeah. But these are all real coordinates of those galaxies. It's, it's actually what, what a hypothetical astronaut would see. Okay. And the whole thing, by the way, the survey would go covering about 11 giga years of the universe. Here is 13.8, so we go quite deep into there. Okay, thank you, Arnold. I think we can switch it off. It goes on and on. It was by way produced also for a planetarium. If you look at the website, there's a flat version, but there's also, you can go to various places in the world. Okay, I have to speed up. Uh, this is the BO I just explained. This is the results were announced in April. And remember W, do you see remember W? That if it's minus one, Einstein was right, that it's just lambda. So here it is, these are the key results from that survey. Minus 0.99 plus minus 15%. If you take only that survey, and you can see the standard rulers there, right? You see them on the movie as well. It's this bump that you have to unveil from that distribution. Uh, and uh, if, if, you, if you add other stuff, other data from cosmic micro background, you'll get it down to 3%. So I'm, now it depends whom you talk to. I feel that it's a great verification that W is minus one. Einstein was right that there is a lambda. He got the value of lambda wrong, but the idea of lambda. But the other friends, in fact, you can read about it uh, in last week's Economist. You'll see stuff about that, who think maybe it's not exactly minus one. Maybe there's some variation with time. So there is a debate, okay? And that's why we need more data. That's, that's the rationale. The question is, is it? now all that, lots of data, we cannot escape from AI, I like to call it augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, because I would not like to throw away the human knowledge. There's you know, good knowledge of physics accumulated over hundreds, even thousands of years. We don't have to throw it away. But this subject is very dominated by it. Back then we extracted features from, from the galaxy, for example, galaxy images, that's something we did 30 years ago. And then you train it on experts and predict the outcome, now there is this idea called deep learning that you show the whole image, and it could tell you what this galaxy is. So all that is fun. You can see the number of papers uh, goes up and up uh, uh, about all these techniques. And we actually, at UCL, created, with help from the Research Council, STFC, we created the Center for Doctoral Training. So our students get trained to simultaneously in astronomy or particle physics, as well as in machine learning and AI. And they can choose what to do. They spend six months in the industry in those four years. And just to give a quick example, a student of mine, Constantina, she went to work for a company and I said, you know, with them, not with me. She worked with them. And I said, what have you worked on? She said, anomaly detection for fraud detection of credit cards. And I said, okay, we can use the same technique to look at spectra of galaxies from DESI. This movie you saw, this comes from spectra. And we're using the same technique to, to discover anomalies in spectra, right? So it shows you the AI is, is very general. At this point, and I realize I have just a few minutes, I allow myself the reflections part. And, you know, occasionally, you know, I'm being paid to do technical work, but occasionally I like to talk to philosophers and anthropologists and write little articles with them about it. So what is dark energy? You know, it could be that we're, we're having something wrong. It could be the mistakes in the measurements. It could also be the case, right? Um, you know, our ruler was not quite what we thought it is. Maybe it was not 30 centimeters, or maybe it was 31 centimeters. We got it all wrong, right? So things like that. It could be that it's really, Einstein was right, it is lambda. W minus one, okay, so remember W of minus one it means it's exactly lambda. It could be something which evolves with time. It could be that uh, we don't understand why particle physicists tell us there should be vacuum energy, they call it. It's a very confusing term, but it's quantum mechanical effect, which could give us a huge energy, and we find only a fraction of it, small fraction. Uh, 
maybe Einstein was not completely right, and this equation I showed you maybe needs a little some tweaks. So some colleagues look into that. And maybe we assume too much that the universe is homogeneous. Then it's getting more and more philosophical. Maybe we're just one of many, many universes. And each universe has its own menu. So we got 70% dark energy. Maybe another one has 10% dark energy. And we are lucky to be in this one because otherwise we, we would not have life the way we have it. Okay, we are very fortunate. Had the universe been too short-lived or too long-lived, we wouldn't be here. Okay, so this is called the anthropic principle. Okay, this is food for thought. And, and th another comment to make is whenever we have an anomaly, there are two possibilities. One is you put something new. So when we saw the orbits in the solar system not quite right, people propose having Neptune. Okay? There are actually two who suggested that. Uh, one one uh, Frenchman and, and, and a Brit suggested Neptune and it was discovered. While with Mercury, it was different. People hypothesized another planet, but at the end it was general relativity that solved the problem, right? So we don't have a recipe to say how do we resolve it. And the same with dark energy, we don't know yet whether it's a new ingredient or we need to throw away Einstein theory. So these are the open questions. Um, and part of that is really to think that we are in a golden age for research. Uh, lots of funding coming. We're very lucky and young people have lots of opportunities to analyze it. Uh, if you like, the, we are the LHC. It's like this experiment in CERN. We have this experiments here. There is a question which I ponder about with a colleague. When to stop? When do you decide? So now it's minus one plus minus three percent. Is that it? Or should you still look to see whether the dark energy is not just a constant, but maybe it has a little tilt? If it has a little tilt, by the way, it would be another Nobel Prize, right? It's, it's, it would be a big thing. So people, some colleagues are very excited about it, and they, I think, going to spend the rest of their life going down to the 1% and sub percent. So I think you'll be relieved. I think I'm just finishing on time. This is the summary that based on current observations, and observations could change, Einstein was right that lambda exists, or something very similar to lambda, this W minus one. But he was wrong, quote unquote, about the value. He tuned it to give a static universe. What we see now, the universe is not only expanding, it's accelerating. So it's just a different value. It's the same equation, just different value. It should have dialed in a different number. This combination of the cosmological constant lambda plus cold dark matter, we call it LCDM, is still supported. No, for a theory to, to survive 30 years, it's not easy, okay? It, it has to pass many, many tests, but we could not relax, relax and look for more techniques, and that's why we want those uh, billions of galaxies to come through on time scale of 10 years. Um, now, I was lucky to see a paradigm shift that it was believed that the cosmological constant is zero, and then it became non-zero, even became the equivalent of 70%. Young people, my students, always lived in the universe with that in that model. They've never seen a change in the paradigm. And you know, it's much more fun, right? When you when you when you change the underlying assumptions and it's a whole new era. Maybe, maybe if if uh, maybe if uh, uh, dark energy is not a constant with time. Maybe there's a tilt, who knows? And finally, I think there's this interesting uh, marriage between cosmology and AI. Personally, I think that we're still waiting for a killer application. I'm very impressed in materials, that these techniques discovered materials and also helped to develop uh, you know, in the area of protein folding, many good stuff. I think we're doing good stuff with astronomy, but we're still waiting to see, you know, AI discovered a robot discovered a new galaxy, right? Which nobody else has seen before. And I think it will happen. Uh, not to mention chat GPT that will solve all the problems of the world, but we'll see. And, and I think if we want to be even more to connect the human brain to the, to the universe and to AI, I, I came up with that sentence at the end, uh, could AI augment our brain? You know, maybe our brain is limited. 
Maybe it cannot understand everything. Right? Maybe there's a limit. Uh, we collect data, but we cannot comprehend it. So maybe AI could augment our brain and figure out the whole universe. And on this optimistic note, I'll stop. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>